So, herzlich willkommen. Uh, that is the only short part in German here. Und ich möchte trotzdem auf Deutsch sagen, weil es ähm, so eine besondere Zusammenarbeit ist zwischen einem Institut in, in Deutschland, in Potsdam, wo wir heute unseren zweiten Gast haben und den deutschen Schulen in Nordamerika. Und ich bin ganz froh, dass unsere Schüler und ähm, Lehrer und, äh, von der Westküste wieder hier sind, also aus, von, von der GSSV. Aber ich freue mich genauso, dass die Zahlen von der Ostküste sich nicht nur verdoppelt, sondern verdreifacht haben. Also herzlich willkommen. Offensichtlich war das äh, der Vortrag der letzten Woche von Felix Naumann, Talk of the Town, nicht nur hier bei uns, sondern auch bei euch. Und äh, wir sind froh, dass ihr da seid. Äh, ich übergebe jetzt gleich an Miss Halpern, Joan Halpern, ist Director of the Hasse Plattner Institute in New York und die wird unseren heutigen Gastredner vorstellen, weil Joanne von Anfang an gesagt hat, wir müssen unbedingt den Sebastian Pase weiter zu kriegen, wenn wir äh, eine Lecture Series für Schüler machen, dann ist es so super interessant, was der macht. Joanne ist... Äh, no pressure, no pressure. <lacht> so, Joanne is not only Director of the Hasse Plattner Institute, uh, sie hat auch eine, eine Professur an der uh, NYU in, in New York und organisiert im HPI Office Präsentationen, Workshops zu verschiedenen Themen. Auf jeden Fall äh, internationale Studien äh, sind ihr Thema und deshalb ist sie auch super interessant, denke ich, für euch als Schüler, wie man seine Karriere so organisiert, um international sich Netzwerke aufzubauen. Das ist sicher ein Thema, wo ihr alle mit liebäugelt. Äh, Vorträge beim HPI in New York sind in der Regel äh, free for everyone to join und äh, Geht da einfach auf die Webseite und in, ja, informiert euch. Super interessante Themen für alle, die hier sind heute zumindest. Wir wissen schon, es gibt auch Leute, die sich dafür nicht so interessieren, aber das kann ich mir eigentlich gar nicht vorstellen. So, I turn over to Joanne to introduce Sebastian. Welcome. Thank you so much, Katrin. And, um, and for you and, especially, and your colleagues, especially Carol Hink, uh, Jenny Jungblut, um, Heike Griel, Katja Köhler, Katrin Webner, This has been a terrific collaboration and I really appreciate all of your, your hard work. And thank you to all of the German schools around North America for joining. We really appreciate this. And as Katrin said, you know, I'm in, in New York. My office is in New York, although Hasse Platner Institute is based in Potsdam, Germany. So we're always here for you for any support that we can offer. Um, so today's speaker is Sebastian Pasewald. He's the CEO of Digital Masterpieces and a researcher in the Computer Graphic Systems Group at the Hassel Platner Institute in Potsdam, Germany. And Sebastian studied at HPI, and he's one of so many HPI's former students who founded a company based on his research. Um, and Sebastian's research interests include 3D virtual city and landscape models, interactive map-like 3D representations, cognitive processing of 3D models, and one of his most recent publications, which he'll probably talk about today, is on Graphite, which is one of his apps, and it's interactive photo to drawing stylization on mobile, mobile devices. And you know, as I mentioned, a lot of companies have been started by HPI students and researchers, but Sebastian and his team have created one of my personal favorites, digital masterpieces and their apps allow you to turn photos into works of art. And they can look like a Kandinsky painting, a Monet painting, a drawing, or a comic. And I've used Sebastian's apps to connect with people at events. You know, I'll say, hey, let's say, you want to take a picture together? And then you turn that picture into something and you can send it to them. And it's a really great way to keep up with people and connect with them, especially for those of you who are shy and you know, have trouble introducing yourself. I love these apps for that. Um, and one of the things that distinguishes digital masterpieces from other apps is it has very sophisticated software in the back end, and it's also the cybersecurity, which HPI is one of its strengths is cybersecurity. And so for the app, talk about Graphite Picasso. Think about the name Picasso. It's like B Picasso. So he's even created with his name, like Picasso, Art Card, and Click to Comic. So Sebastian, with that, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very, very kind introduction. All the beloved words. Thank you, everybody who's joined this talk. Thank you for organizing this talk. Um, I have something around 60 minutes. I have a way too much content, so this uh, ride will be pretty <laughs> rough for you because it's in the morning. Um, for me, it's pretty rough because it's more or less in the evening. And since my wife is a teacher, I got up something like 6 a.m. in the morning. But most likely, it will be joyful for 
every participant. At least I will try uh, to give my best. Okay, first things first, let's start with the title of my talk, which is somehow a little bit cryptic uh, or mysterious. And the title of the talk is How is Technology Redefining Our Creativity? And I try to address this question in my talk from two different sides. First, how does technology, especially IT products or technology, um, foster our cre creativity? With our, I mean um, the creativity of people like you um, using mobile apps, um, using or creating digital art or creating uh, images and photos and videos, um, but also how does IT change the way or foster the creativity of software developer, creating tools for create uh, for creatives. The second um, try, or the second thing I would like to address is, do we even need to be creative anymore when artificial intelligence, or better word for that is machine learning, and can we create art um, today at a very, very, very high quality? In order to address both questions, I will give you some theoretical and practical background from um, our joint research projects. So our joint research project, the project of Digital Masterpieces is a company and the Hasso Plattner Institute um, as a research partner. And I will also um, give you some examples what um, eager students are capable of if they um, have become digital engineers on the way to a digital engineering expert if they get the right tools and the right teaching from the Hasso Plattner Institute. Having said that, let's start with a quite prominent example from 2016. Um, you can get more information um, about this if you go to nextrembrandt.com. Um, Microsoft, the uh, Technical University of Delft and some other partners had the mission to recreate or create a new Rembrandt image. And then most of you know Rembrandt is not alive anymore, so it's quite a, ha a hard um, challenge or task to create something which looks like that Rembrandt has all um, painted him by, uh, by himself. Um, so the mission was pretty hard and they tackled it using artificial intelligence or machine learning. So they collected roughly 150 gigabytes of digital image data from um, original Rembrandt pictures, not just color information, but also 3D information. They analyzed it to look for certain patterns. So patterns um, that repeat themselves because Rembrandt always painted that way, colors Rembrandt uh, used um, more often. And based on that data, they developed and designed uh, machine lear learning algorithms and techniques that try to identify that pattern pretty um, good and rearrange or merge these patterns into something new. So they also developed an algorithm or a technique that recreates a new image that looks like a Rembrandt. The machine took approximately 500 hours to create a 140 um, megapixel image, which had such a high quality that even expert had hard time um, to distinguish if this is just a lost picture of Rembrandt, he painted by himself um, a few years, a few hundred years ago, or if it's something a machine created in 2016. So actually the question boils down is when machine can recreate or create new artwork, do we even need to be creative anymore? The question is pretty easy. Yes, we have to be creative because for me, artificial intelligence or machine learning is just a tool. It's a tool, for example, like a um, mower. It's perfectly suited for certain tasks, for example, mowing grass. But giving this tool in the hands of creative people, it can be also used for different tasks, like having fun during races or creating something beautiful, like artwork um, with a mower. So artificial intelligence or machine learning is just a tool um, which can help us to foster creativity. And Real Digital Masterpieces uses such tools to transform images like we see here into something which could be drawn by hand, for example, like this pencil etching filter. But compared to next Rembrandt project, we and our users shouldn't wait for 500 hours. We want to transform an image like this in a fraction of a second um, into an image like this so that we can first also apply these effects on video, but also give the user um, the possibility to interactively change aspects of the image, to get creative, um, to create something which is unique, 
which originates from a photo and his imagination, its creativity to create something beautiful he can share on or have fun with. And we succeeded um, as, in this mission. So digital masterpieces uh, or the products from digital masterpieces, you can become a digital artist, even if you have not been the best um, person in art class like me. Um, I was only good at technical illustrations and there was able to um, get mark one. Otherwise it was something like a two or three in a German grading system. Um, nevertheless, um, as CEO of digital masterpieces of our um, team, we were able to create different apps and frameworks for visual media transformation that's help people to get creative to create something beautiful to create something unique and we do this together with our partner with digital masterpieces you beca can become a digital artist with the, uh, with the Hasso Platten Institute you can um, become a digital engineering expert and as Joanne already mentioned I'm um, from the computer graphic systems group and the computer graphic systems group um, mainly does research and development um, in the fields of information visualization visual analytics and visual computing to make it a little bit more precise, um, we are concerned with software analytics, so analyzing um, large software systems, extracting information, giving the unseen an image, a face, so that the human can understand these complex software systems and identify patterns. Geospatial analytics is pretty much the same, but not for software systems, but real world. Here we see, for example, a 3D point cloud analyzed to identify different trees and also um, buildings. Um, data visualization um, for the geospatial domain, but also um, the financial domain that's from the geospatial domain uh, is where I originated from. And what I like about visualization most is that we can create an image um, which helps us to communicate. And especially the abstraction of the image, like we see here in the water, for example. I'm not sure if you see my uh, mouse cursor right now. This was something I was especially interested because the computer was able to generate based on photorealistic information new information that helps us to better understand a certain problem or a certain information. And that was the point where I moved from the data visualization domain to video processing domain. In our group, um, where I also did my bachelor's, um, we are giving lectures like 3D computer graphics, but also um, seminars like game programming or image and video processing seminars, where the students learn the basics of computer graphics and learn to apply them to software systems by writing their own games, by writing their own image and video processing apps um, or filters. And once quite unique thing about the um, Hassel Platten Institute is that at the end of your bachelor's, you will do a bachelor project with fellow students, something like three to seven students with a real industrial customer. So you're trying to tackle a real world problem from the industrial customer during your bachelor project, bringing solutions um, to pretty hard problems. And digital masterpieces at Hassel Platner Institute did at least three bachelor projects in the last um, three years. Okay, as soon as you've done your bachelor's, you can continue your journey um, with the master program, which more focus on a practical or, uh, application or, um, and also on research, so a bigger focus on seminars. And why I'm stressing the point of seminars? Um, basically, because our company and our first product originated from an image and video processing seminar. A former student of mine, Frank Schlegel, attended the seminar at the Hasso Platner Institute in 2012. And he tried to bring a quite complex rendering technique, which um, first only run on gaming PCs on servers to a mobile device, namely the iPhone 4S. And spoiler alert, he succeeded in doing so. And this was the first version of Clip to Comic where a user can load an image and stylize it as a cartoon and even create a caricature. And we, results of his work um, were um, demonstrated in our wall, on our wall of fame, um, in our communication area, where we get also visitors from companies, from other research institutions, and also from the press. And the people started asked, asking questions, which artists actually created these caricatures. And they were quite surprised when we saw, uh, told them that it was an IT student because artist and IT student doesn't go hand in hand in most people's minds. 
what I totally understand. Um, the people started asking, okay, can we get the product? Can the student do caricatures of myself, of my family? And they uh, started asking, asking over and over again. So we decided that it's maybe a good idea to start a company and do it right. Um, again, spoiler alert, was a good idea. Um, but the main challenge we had to face is how can we align research so be innovative the whole time so that we can't get copied so easily and combine this with our daily jobs so app development which is quite a hard job because there's a lot of things to do and the answer was quite pretty uh, forward let's continue and extend our cooperation with the Aso Platni Institute in joint research project and jo joint seminar projects. And we're doing this since 2013, having quite a good track, uh, track record. For example, we got uh, three research, multi-million multi research projects running and finished. We did approximately 20 joint teaching activities, including seminars, um, as well as bachelor projects. And last but not least, we published more than 30 papers and released five apps. You can freely download, download on the Apple App Store or on the macOS App Store. And the coolest thing on this cooperation is that we are quite good at undergraduate research. So every teaching project we do, and together with bachelor and master students, we try to push them to their limits um, so that they learn a lot invent something uh, invent something worth to be published and we were able to um, get for example the best paper award with bachelor students at the sick of asia in 2017 in bangkok which is quite an honor for the students as well as for the hbi and has a nice side effect that the students can visit bangkok even during the bachelor um, during the bachelor degree finally all that activities research teaching um comes up uh, or we try to put it in the product as soon as possible for example we see here Picasso uh, where you can apply uh, um, machine learning algorithms like style transfer in no time on the device to images but that's just the starting point of your creative journey you can combine them with algorithmic abstraction techniques like a pencil hatching or a, a watercolor and compared to other um, products or tools um, this is not just a one button solution you are free to change nearly every aspect of the image processing pipeline so of the final result giving you maximum creativity um, to uh, implement your ideas Okay, so much for the introduction. I'm already four minutes late. Um, so we'll cut down the technical uh, part a little bit more slightly. Um, but why are we actually able um, to create such deep tech tools that are usable by humans? It's basically because our research and teaching project focus on different aspects of the image and video transformation universe. For example, one focus for sure is the data. So looking at the images, the videos, 3D models are included in the image processing pipeline, but also knowledge, so the DNA, how does uh, how the user interact with the uh, picture, what is aesthetic, what is beautiful. These data is input for the abstraction techniques that transforms the image, but we are also relying on image analysis and video, like machine learning to identify certain objects like people um, or background in the image. And everything um, is used to parameterize our rendering techniques um, to ease the interaction process for the user. Because just for example, the watercolor is something like 45 technical parameters that can be fine-tuned to achieve a unique result. Giving these parameters to a user would overwhelm the user. Um, so we try to abstract from that, automate, um, yeah, try to implement automatism um, to get the first starting point right and then bring the user in and provide a good user experience a good ux um, effective yet efficient user interface so that the user gets control over the um, different abstraction techniques in the following i will talk a little about um about the data itself so that you get a better understanding because most of you will most likely be um, or considered with photos and i will talk about image data more or less image data is pretty easy or can be um, defined pretty straightforward it consists of pixels so single image points that are arranged in a 2d grid each pixel can be addressed by its position starting at zero zero in the top uh, left corner ending at n m with n being the image 
with M being the image eight. And so we can address every pixel and get the data of every pixel for our filter operations. The data can be different. Um, most of you are um, familiar with classical photos or RGB images where we stored uh, red, green, and blue informations per pixel. But we can also store other informations to a picture, for example, just luminance um, value as we can see before. The other things uh, which might be of interest um, are the precision of each channel. So how many different information we can um, store in that channel. Higher precision means um, we can um, define more different green tones. For example, instead of 265 uh, green tones, we can um, define more than 4 billion um, green tones if we have 32-bit precision. Okay, next on, um, I would like to focus, um, I would like to do a short questionnaire with you. Uh, I will show you some pictures and um, the question is pretty easy. The question is, what do you see? Please use the chat window. You have something like 10 seconds and try to answer that question. Um, and we will see if this is right. It's okay. 10 seconds running, what do you see? That's right, Australia. Why is Australia black and white? Is there a reason for this? No, it's not night. Okay, so Australia is elevation totally right. So what we he see here is a hate map. So basically um, we have the data about the hate normalized between zero that's black and one that's white and we store these elevation uh, information into an image and we can use this image for example to efficiently encode um, a two and a half d terrain model of this awesome what do we see here mm -hmm. fabric yeah facility that's right and so a color image, um, basically, uh, anybody has an idea why this color image is so dull, why it looks so flat? Pretty easy, uh, well, no, not pretty easy, because we only see the albedo, so the color encoded information. Um, so we now know that it's a facility. What do we see here? No shading, correct, Julie? Little tip, it's the same facility. So it's the same um, scenery, but now we're using the color differently. We're using the color to encode 3D information. So the X, Y, Z position in 3D space is mapped to zero one um, and encoded in color. This can be um, understood if you see how the color tones are um, evolving in or are yeah, by evolving in the image, for example, the bluish tone uh, gets more into a greenish tone when we move down the scene and red is more prominent on our uh, right side. Next one, this is pretty tricky. Again, same scene. Okay, due to time constraints, specular intensity. So we have something like material properties and code into, a, um, into an image. So everything which is made of iron has a high specular intensity. So it gets shiny uh, artifacts if we shed light on it and we can encode this here. Here we've got normal information, uh, which basically means the orientation of the surface. And if we put that all together, we can use deferred shading to recreate a colored image. The cool thing here is all the information we had before, we can use to do a night scene like we see here. We can use the same information, the same geometric buffer or G buffer information to do also a um, colored scene. This one is um, pretty easy. It's a car. Does anybody know what car ink of car it is? It's free, it's an iconic car. Yeah, okay, that was easy. So uh, enter around. and we all only see the albedo uh, information. So the colors are coded RGB. And that's actually what we deal with at digital masterpieces or algorithm. They get an RGB image. And based on that, we create something like this. Never seen by a user before, just by HBI students and you. Anyone knows what this could be? Okay, it's somehow related to edges, it's a structure tensor. It gives us orientation information about the edges in the image, 
large they are and how they are oriented in an image. We use this information, for example, to create something like this, which is a flow field um, simulating how uh, if we were, would put sand into or onto that image and blow wind along that sand, how the um, sand would um, place themselves along edges. This can be, for example, used to create an oil effect. This one is the most hardest um, task um, because it's so hard, I will just uh, keep it short. It's forest, yeah, it's a lake, it's a photo. And that's the thing we are most familiar with, and that's the input data we're actually dealing with. So this is the input data we have um, dealing with. You have learned that um, we can use images or texture to represent um, data in a 2D grid and use this for different purposes. Height fields for um, 3D geometry generation, for example. We can encode uh, intermediate results like edges or um, gradient, which can be then used later on to create, for example, an oil effect based on flow fields. Now we know what data we are dealing with. With now, let's jump onto um, the topic of non-photorealistic rendering um, or image abstraction, which has to deal with algorithmics but also with aesthetics. So, um, if you think of Hollywood, um, a lot of people for, uh, who are technical artists are dealing in that uh, or are working in that field, and um, at digital masterpieces and at the computer graphics group, we are developing algorithms that try to automatically abstract images in a very aesthetic way, whatever this may mean. For this, we are using filter operations. Um, filter operation can be can be thought of a black box, which gets an input or an uh, input image and generates an output image. And based on the spatial extent the filter operation is working at, we can distinguish or categorize them between point-based operations, which only deal with one point or one pixel, neighborhood information, which look in the near facility of one pixel, geometric operation, which deals with a larger extent, or global operations, which deals with the whole image. The following, I will shortly introduce point-based and neighborhood uh, filter operations because that's mostly the only thing we need in order to create, for example, a tool effect. A pretty straightforward point-based filter operation is the color to gray operation. It takes an input pixel. Short question, do you see my mouse cursor? Yes? No. Okay, cool. Yes, so we do. It, take, yeah. it takes an input image or input pixel. Uh, at a certain position, x, y, get uh, uses the RGB information and um, calculates new information based on that RGB information, so-called intensity information. And the RGB, former RGB information, is replaced by the triple III, so the intensity information. And in order to compute this intensity information, we simply use the red channel, multiply it by a certain rate, um, add the um, green channel again multiplied by a certain weight and do the same thing with the blue channel. Since the weights sum up to one um, and the response in R, G and B is between zero and one, the result is also between zero and one. So we've got uh, intensity, which might be zero, like these black pixels, which might be white um, for the white pixels and something in between, so between zero and one. And we equally um, do um, replace the RGB information with the intensity information, transforming an RGB image into a grayscale image. Really easy. This concept is nearly the same for every filter operation. So we always look at one pixel, do some math, to generate the value of another pixel. For convolutional or neighborhood filter operations, we don't look at just at one pixel, but we have a filter kernel, which has a spatial extent. So for the pixel of interest, the region of interest here in the center, we look at all pixel in the neighborhood, so in their three by three neighborhood, and um, calculate the new pixel value based on the pixel values in the neighborhood. And we do this for every every single pixel, um, generating a new image. Pretty easy concept, also pretty easy to implement, gets a little bit harder um, based on a filter kernel, and it looks a little bit more scientific if we look at the mathematical description. Um, Basically, it's just two sums, one sum uh, to weight or two weighted sums, one that goes for uh, along um, 
the um, y uh, x position. So um, we, we see the term right here, and which goes along the m position. And um, every pixel value is multiplied by a certain weight. And for example, the mean filter, which has application noise reduction and blurring, um, the filter value is calculated on the spatial extent of the filter. So by, uh, for a three by three filter kernel, every weight is the same. And if we do the weighted sum based on that filter kernel, we do the average of all pixels in that filtered kernel in order to create or to calculate a new filter kernel. Increasing the filter kernel will increase the softness or the blurriness of the effect. And actually this effect, especially with smaller filter kernels is used nearly in every advertisement um, you see in every newspaper um, to reduce noise um, or also in apps like Facetune to um, create a more soft and a more beautiful face, for example. So we have now the point-based filter operation and we have the neighborhood-based filter operation that's Again, nearly everything we need in order to transform such an image into such an image. Um, okay, maybe a little bit more, so the algorithms are a little bit more clever, and especially the way the filters are organized in a complex filter pipeline. Um, for example, we I think we use something like 30 different filters for that, that automatically adapt themselves based on the underlying data, uh, but the concept is always the same. Let's take a look how the different human understandable um, steps look like for that watercolor filter. First, we have the input image. We use a point-based filter operation, which um, uses the XY position of a pixel um, in the distance to the center to determine if we should paint the vignette, so make the pixel white, or only lighten the pixel a little bit. Simple point-based operation based on the position of the pixel. Turbulence, again, pretty simple. We are using a texture and apply them to that to simulate how water and pigments um, interact with each other uh, on the canvas. We do some color grading, some colors moving. We introduce some gaps. We introduce some edge darkening, wet and wet, wobbling effects, sketchy contours, pigment dispersion at fine scale, medium scale, and finally blend everything with a substrate and the uh, image is done. I think that was something like 12 different steps a human can understand. In the background, there's something like rendering, uh, 30 rendering stages. So we do um, fetch each image approximately 30 times, use some quite heavy math on them in order to create such an image. And designing such an algorithm or such a technique, a um, combination of different algorithms, um, requires a lot of know-how, a lot of experience, um, understanding of the art form, um, which we try to imitate, and it's quite a hard job. For example, Ami took something like one year of research not full-time, but half-time, approximately to come up with the first version, another half a year um, for the first iteration, another half a year for the final iteration. So something like two years from the starting point till the algorithm or technique is finished. And it's from a tech, from a company point of view, this doesn't scale very much. So what do what, what happens if we want a new uh, algorithm, like an oil paint or a new comic filter? Wait or invest work for two years? That's pretty hard. Um, but it's worthwhile because we can use, uh, we get some degrees of freedom with those algorithm techniques. First of all, we can optimize them to make them pretty fast so that we get intermediate response um, when we transform that image. We can control nearly every aspect um, of that image, uh, of that style, for example, creating a black and white gray pencil hatching or color style. We can um, do more other lines, more sketchy lines. And that not just a global level as we see here with one slider, but we can also use our finger and modify the style in a certain region. For example, uh, decreasing the sketchiness, bringing out more details in the foreground or reworking the buildings in the background. That's something what you can do if you have control about the algorithm, but it comes for price, so the development price. 
But what happens when we say, okay, we don't need that much control, but we want the algorithm pretty um, fast, uh, pretty soon. That's where the iterative style transfer, which was introduced in 2050, really be uh, begins to shine. The style transfer only needs one input image and an example of a style, for example, like um, Van Gogh's uh, Dairy Night in the lower left. Then you tell the machine, the machine learning algorithm, um, please take your time, something like two to eight minutes on a um, good gaming PC, and it creates something like this. Which is quite a game changer. What was quite a game changer when it comes to image abstraction. Um, but it was, uh, it shouldn't have been a surprise because machine learning and also convolutional neural networks have been out before. But again, some researchers thought, okay, there is a tool the machine learning tool, let's use it in a different way. Let's use it for style transfer. So again, technology fostering um, creativity, creating something new. And I will um, share some um, informations on that machine learning part and how this neural network, which at least when you um, think of press, does something intelligent, is something magic. Um, but honestly, it's just well-trained dumb machine, um, which originates from um, the computer vision task. There they know convolutional neural networks for quite some time, and they are primarily used for image and video processing techniques. So just for example, if you put an image into Google uh, image search, you, you, um, convolutional neural networks are used to see what is part of the image. Is it a container ship, a motor scooter, and suggest different uh, similar images. Facebook is using a convolutional neural networks most likely in all your images to identify um, certain contact, uh, contents um, so that they can give you the right advertisement for that. Um, the only thing you need is a convolution neural network, somebody who understands what's going on in the network, and a lot of input data. And as you may um, guess, Google, Facebook has a lot of input data, and luckily they are also sharing them with the researchers. So that there have been a lot of advancement in the last years on the research side, especially since 2015. We're using uh, digital masterpieces. We are, for example, using these convolutional neural networks for segmentation to see, okay, where's the person and treat the person differently. But it's also used in um, detection task to uh, identify or detect, for example, um, cars or pedestrian, if you think, uh, think about um, autonomously driving cars. Um, another thing where it's used um, or where it's creatively used is a uh, lower example. Machine learning algorithms or convolutional neural networks are pretty good at pattern detection. And if you think about old games or new games, it's all about rule-based stuff. It's all about patterns. And here, a network was trained on a very old game to identify patterns. And the network was also trained how to use that pattern information. For example, as a submarine, um, let's try to avoid divers or enemies. And so it was able to play the game just based on that input image and the data and the rules it learned. Why is it able to learn it? Or why wh why is it even for a neural network or convolutional neural network? Um, it's something to make it a little bit more understandable for general public and um, to say, okay, it's somehow working like our brain, which consists of neurons. And urine is basically nothing else than a computational unit, which gets input data, some rates associated to that input data, and which builds or uh, creates or well, sums them up. We have learned it from one of the convolutional filter operations. So basically, it's just a weighted sum. If you combine that with an activity fu uh, activation function, which reacts on the sum's result, for example, gives you a one as an uh, output. If the sum is greater than zero and a zero one otherwise, you have a perceptron, which is a single layer neural network. This helps you uh, already to achieve certain tasks, uh, but not complex tasks as we saw before, like. Um, this image recognition tasks. And as you also know, most of our brains consists of more than one neuron or one perceptron. Um, 
that's also um, the idea of neural networks. So it's combining different neurons, multiple neurons um, together in so-called hidden layers. And there are a lot of, lot of um, different neurons and layers combined. Um, and as soon as it gets more than five layers, uh, researchers tend to um, talk about not machine learning, but deep learning instead, because it's a very, very deep network. Um, actually, um, the convolutional neural networks we're dealing with are pretty complex, are pretty deep, and the research is going into um, adding even more layer to handle more complex tasks in one direction, but also trying to optimize that layers. So now we more or less know how a, a neural network works just getting some input data, some applying some weights, build, uh, building a sum out of it, and defining activation function. Convolutional neural networks operate a little bit differently. Um, what we see, saw before is the fully connected part on the back, uh, on the back um, of this network. In the foreground, this data handling is currently done in convolutional neural networks with convolutional filter you saw before um, in the linear or neighborhood filtering operations. And the filter kernel is put over an image and tries to identify certain features. The cool thing on neural networks is you don't have to specify what features or how the filter kernel should look like. You only have to define what the neural network should be looking for. For example, cats. And if the neural network doesn't identify cats based on sample data, it does some back propagation, learns the features, different rates, the activation function by itself, and is then capable of creating correct feature maps, feature maps that helps you to solve your task. Many of you, or at least great parts of the public, um, got the first idea what these networks are capable of with the Google Deep Team Dream Project, which is from a um, public relationship point of view, really, really awesome. Because it says, okay, there's machine learning, which can dream. So it's not just clever, intelligent, like artificial, artificial intelligent, it can even have emotions, it can dream, it can be creative. Um, but yeah, only the name suggests that it can dream or that it can, uh, that it can be creative because again, it's just a network which tries to learn something. And here we see an activation um, based on the, the reaction of the network based on the convolutional filter operations, the activation function. And this is visualized into an image, an image of clouds. And here we see something which is quite familiar, like building uh, models, but it can also be something quite weird, like this thing which uh, people called Admiral Dog or the pig snare. So it was something which was really, really interesting, which blew up people's mind because they thought, okay, this is really beautiful, this is surprising, and the machine can actually dream. This very same idea, so analyzing something, identifying some features and visualizing these features is the basis for the iterative style transfer where you saw the images before. But here we analyze two pictures, one photo, that's the input image, and one style image. These images are reconstructed in different um, layers with very fine-grained structures in the higher levels of the um, network and with more semantic or broad, uh, uh, more coarse structures uh, in the lower part of the convolutional neural network. And the network tries to minimize the distance or the visual difference or the mathematical difference between this picture, the reconstruction, and this reconstruction or a mathematical feature representation of the different features of the input image and that style image. And this does it, for example, I think for the um, iterative style transfer, something like 8,000 to 12,000 iterations. So doing the same process 8,000 to 12,000 times um, in, in a row and trying to minimize the distance so that we can still identify buildings from this picture in here, but having them in a style which looks close similar like starry night for example these black structures again introduced here we've got uh, um, quite prominent starry night um, painting um, up in this um, sky but 
having said that, it's somehow, at least for the interval to start transfer, it's not that clear what comes out. So there's no control over it. And this yields, uh, and it comes also to the problem that you have to wait two to eight minutes for it. But it was just a starting point because instead of doing this process over over again for uh, one new image, you can train a network to learn a specific style and apply it to a new image um, within a fraction of a second. And we did quite a clever thing um, on the mobile device. You see here the style transfer applied in near real time. So we have a 2016 iPad Pro, which is quite a powerhouse. And we have a Core ML implementation. Um, which is Apple's machine learning framework. And we are able to apply the style transfer uh, within, I think, 120 milliseconds for a two megapixel uh, image. Compared to two or eight minutes, 120 milliseconds offer us certain possibilities. For example, as we saw here, um, adjusting certain parts of the uh, pre-trained model, again, using image transformations. So the style transfer can only produce something like this, it nearly looks the same for every input image, but if you apply image processing or abstraction techniques, you get some control by creating something different, something new, something beautiful in real time. Another problem which underlines my hypothesis that, um, or my claim that a neural network on a, a machine learning algorithm is quite dumb is that it only tries to match patterns. For example, if we analyze that style, we see that, um, for example, trees, which are obviously here in that image, on that image, and most likely here, are styled differently. Also, elements from the skyline uh, are introduced to the um, grassy area to the hill right here. So no artist would paint that way if, it, if the artist tries to reproduce that picture. And that's basically because the machine doesn't know about the semantics um, that much and doesn't know about the intention of the user of the creative artist. And we at Digital Masterpieces in a joint research project with Haas of Platten Institute did some improvement on this project by getting the user again into the game. The user can now paint uh, areas in the image and says, okay, this is one style. This is the style I would like to have for my trees. Um, we can identify trees in the input image and we can map that style improving the visual quality or the coherence um, of these uh, objects. We can also define, okay, this um, is one style which we would love to have for the skyline. This is obvious skyline, so please apply these. So giving the user control back um, about the algorithm, the machine learning technique, um, resulting in more creative control, giving him a real tool to use to create something more meaningful, something more plausible, and maybe more beautiful. The same thing, our ongoing research project is also concerned with user control. Oh, well, uh, video doesn't play right now. Um, it's about um, actually changing the application of the style. So how coarse it is or how fine it is. You can compare it with changing the thickness of a um, pen or of a brush, for example. Okay, that was pretty deep dive. And it was pretty fast, but the good news is we are almost done. And now it gets a little bit more relaxed. I'm on the way to my wrap up and focusing more on application examples, focusing more on images and videos, which are to my best understanding more enjoyable in the morning than mathematics um, or technical deep dives. Again, in my opinion, artificial uh, intelligence is just a tool, um, such as, for example, MOA, and can be used creatively. And that's the same thing we are experiencing at Digital Masterpieces. We created our tools, um, which at the heart only get some data, apply some machine learning in order to create non-photoristic rendering, and we provide a user interface for user, so that the user can use the tool, but we don't tell the user for what application example it um, should use it, and we give them just some suggestions. And it's pretty interesting how users are actually using it. For example, um, we have, um, especially from the US, a lot of um, the 
um, pupil or uh, um, the students would say older people, the teacher would say uh, best agers, um, which are active on Facebook and creating digital art um, based on photos when they walk in the park or landscape. So this this one is actually generated by, I think, a 60 years old lady um, doing a really great job in our um, Facebook group. The right picture is from an Indonesian um, artist. I would say he's an artist. Um, he's also a photographer uh, who does a lot of pictures um, from the Indonesian culture and addressing certain challenges um, they have in their social economic life and using uh, image abstraction techniques. Um, he gives this picture a certain aesthetic um, by at the same time saving the privacy of the people he's depicting. And he's using this uh, technology for storytelling to a very high degree, a very hard touching degree. So it's very, very interesting how differently our tools are used. We did also a um, small prototype for events in education. Um, here in Germany, there's always an Edeka tour. Edeka is like Aldi or Kaufland, a grocery um, shop um, or franchise. And the idea of this event are, um, is that the children can play while the parents could spend money in a supermarket. Um, and we helped the um, event organizers to achieve that goal in providing an app which transforms images into outline images based on our comic technology. These are printed and then the um, kids can again just paint them. So it was a nice and joyful project for us because we um, combined the digital world with our tools again um, with the manual world, uh, world that artists will use like pencil um, and stuff like this. Um, this was one of the first books um, by Donna Valentine, again, a best ager from the US, um, who's loving to do uh, walks in the park or near vicinity together with their nephews or grandchildren. And the cool thing here is she is always telling the grandchildren stories. And she came up with the idea to put the stories into a book and she wanted to illustrate it. And she used Picasso to transform the pictures um, she took during the walk to um, do illustration of that and combine it with this short stories with the poems and this was really very surprising for us that um, our tools which was been done by IT people only is used such a creative um, and productive way Virtual storytelling and content marketing is pretty straightforward. Um, as everybody knows, and the students better than me, images uh, are everywhere on Instagram and Facebook most likely you're not the Facebook in the generation anymore, uh, on TikTok uh, even, um, used to share moments from life. And as soon as it gets rival, um, great, uh, larger companies use these channels to do content marketing. For example, we see here a visual story created with clip to comic um, showcasing a um, um, bicycle team from, from Quebec. We know that Ali, the Allianz Versicherung is using our tools for content marketing and also the telecom. Last but not least, art creation. That's why we did this actually. Um, and people are using our tool in conjunction with different tools to create something beautiful and unique. Here we see a postcard that was done by, again, an old lady from the US. And she did this um, postcards and um, hijacked of this postcards museums because she um, claimed that the museum doesn't show um, too, uh, uh, that they, museums show two less surrealistic images. So she created them by herself, put them on a postcard and introduced this postcard into the merchandising um, part of the museum to inspire other people as well. Now we're looking at something quite differently. Um, an approach, a research project, um, again, with undergraduate students and PhD students, which transforms short videos um live photos into just one photo still depicting motion so what we did is analyze the motion of the picture uh, people or objects using optical flow and doing abstraction for the whole picture just to illustrate it and add different um, effects we know from illustration also from comic like these motion lines or ghost lines and um, to create just one image which visualize motion. It was just a technical proof we published in the SIGGRAPH, I think, in 2018. 
Chronophotography is something I really, really like because, again, it visualizes something. It shows something which is more or less hidden in a video, so the motion, just in one picture. For example, here a student um, who is into uh, mountain biking just wanted to see how he moves along uh, with the uh, mountain bike to optimize um, his riding, for example, and use chronophotography to see the different um, steps in motion. This is a project um, going on. Um, here we see a video um, put into one of the Apple Vision frameworks. The Apple Vision framework uses machine learning to identify poses or the skeleton of persons. And having this information, so how the person has, uh, where the person has his hands, we can use this again to do something joyful or something a little bit more weird inspired from comics. For example, as soon as we identify when the two um, boxes hit each other, we can um, bring in some additional information um, like these stickers, as we know from comic, these Pow Wow stickers, for example. Again, a teaching project or research project we did in a seminar. Machine learning, computer vision is also used for improving interaction with images. For example, here we see the application of a graph cut algorithm, which um, uses these rough sketches from um, a user to understand what regions the user is actually trying to select. And using graph cut, um, the picture is subdivided into different se segments. The graph is joined again or traversed again. And so we can identify that region based on image information and some sketches and selecting um, the car or the background gets you much more easy as would, uh, as when you would do it just with um, the magical lasso or the polygonal tool um, from Photoshop or not so clever tools. Um, this is a project, not sure if this is actually visible. Um, it's about videos. Again, project where we heavily relying on Apple's built-in tools for machine learning. Here we see two things. First, um, based on the LiDAR sensor in machine learning, we identify the outline of a person. That's the reddish part you see. Further, we, um, we here or try to uh, identify certain um, noise, um, acoustic signals like this or this. And based on that, we visualize that, um, creating a video effect, um, which will is currently the starting point for a new secret publication, uh, which we will um, try to, or which we will submit um, beginning of next year. Um, hopefully, again, it will be so, uh, accepted for the happy hour. Okay, let's come to the wrap up. Um, we saw quite tremendous advances in artificial intelligence or machine learning in the past five years and even more in the last three years, giving us as developer, um, and what we can identify is that these new approaches to image recognition, but also image abstraction, mostly outperforms um, tra uh, traditional vi visual media analysis um, by order of magnitude. So they are faster, they are more robust, so more reliable, which is a key issue if you want to use them, um, for example, for autonomous driving cars, but also for view anal analysis, for example. What we also saw is that image processing frameworks and tools um, are currently not really using the data to a large extent. So most of the tools do something like, oh, there is a human, let's cut this human out, um, add some um, funny beard, um, or replace it in a background so it's more for entertainment. Um, Adobe does quite, quite a great job, and also some indie uh, companies beside us using this machine learning techni technology to help the people achieve the goals, better by improving actually um, their tools based on machine learning um, data. So letting the machine do the stupid jobs, giving a person more mental capacity to actually do the creative job. So that we strongly believe, and we are working on that day for day together with our research partner, that future apps um, will be more expressive and assist the user in creating visual media. So actually technology, will foster our creativity because 
it reduces the burden of doing labor intensive uh, intensive or stupid tasks but for this um you need some clever guys um you need well educated people you need people who think out of the box and who are not just experts in IT, but also expert in problem solving. And that's something really unique at the Hasso Plattner Institute and together with the design thinking school, they are teaching people to solve problems in an effective and efficient manner and also in an interdisciplinary manner. So not just IT people solving IT problems, but IT people together with people from the creative arts, uh, from politics, from economics, from health sector, identifying problems and finding and um, trying to find a joint solution. We are pretty blessed and honored and very happy that we have this joint uh, research cooperation with the Hasso Plattner Institute. Uh, we've got more than seven master thesis, three bachelor projects, which is really an awesome experience um, as a students to work for approximately one year together in a team solving a problem. And um, but it's also very, very um, satisfying um, for the personal for the teachers at the HPI to see how the students evolve in that year, how they creativity solve problems and how they interact uh, with each other. We have more than 30 uh, bachelor and master seminar topics, a lot of publications, including the largest public uh, venues in the world, namely the SIGGRAPH and the SIGGRAPH Asia, uh, Asia. And somehow all our employees at digital masterpieces are former HPI students, um, PhD students, master students, and I'm pretty happy with, the, um, with that because the HPI really create, no, not creates, um, students of the HPI are really, really capable um, of solving problems, not just in IT, they're also capable of communication and leading teams or being part of a team which is very, very uh, valuable for us. And we plan to, um, and we encourage everybody um, to look for such a strong research partner, to um, bring back the experience from products from um, the company back into teaching, because it gives you so much benefits, um, which cannot, uh, which really pay off uh, in short, but for a uh, long term. Last but not least, um, some advertisement. Um, feel free to download our app, Picasso, um, Clip to Comic or Graphite. Just look for digital masterpieces or just write me an email. And I can add you to our beta testing program, for example, so that you get all um, all features in our apps for free because they are freemium apps, so free to download, but for premium features, you have to pay. Um, please also don't hesitate um, to reach out to me if you're looking for an internship at Digital Masterpieces or if you're interested um, in joining the Hasso Plattner Institute. Um, at least it's pretty hard to join the Hasso Plattner Institute. You, so you have to be a quite excellent student uh, with very, very, very good grades in math, um, even in English and German, uh, which would, was quite a problem for me in the old times. But luckily, there were, um, the HPI was not that prominent. Um, and beside that excellent um, grades, you also need you are clinky, um, the cat is morning. Um, you also need um, some practical uh, experience. So having an internship um, or being part of um, extra school activities, um, IT projects is always advisable. That's all from my side. I'm pretty much in one hour. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I was not too fast and I'm now looking forward to your feedback and your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Vazavald, for that insightful presentation.